What are the factors that lead to income inequality, do you think? Well, it, at different factors. Provision of the basic, basic services, for example, I mentioned that before, is like you have to have cover, water supply, uh, sewage services, all the major issues, electricity, connectivity, could be in roads and, and internet. These are basic needs for the people, so you have to supply that as a government. And it's very hard sometimes when you have a country like Peru, which has, is a desert and high mountains and an Amazon basin, it's hard to provide those services. But you have to find disruptive way to provide those services. Jobs. Jobs are very important because people need to feel that they are uh, proud of their own lives. They don't want that somebody give them uh, extra money and that's it. Of course, that will be very comfortable, but at the same time, they don't feel proud of themselves. If they, jobs have an opportunity and that means markets for, for the things they do, then they will be proud of themselves. And of course, have the right policy in terms of income distribution, that means taxes are important so we can provide those services and, 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 and provide. But if we create a market that can create jobs, a market of opportunities, that's why we ha have all the signatures of these free trade agreements, because we knew that we can create jobs through that. As a matter of fact, the creation of those have brought us to possibly to be connected with countries like China, US, Europe, and, and everywhere else with our products. And you're eating quinoa here in US because we are producing that and we are exporting to the world. And you can find blueberries are Peruvian and asparagus are Peruvian all over the world. So that means somebody is producing that. That is a worker, that is a farmer in the highland, in the coast, or in the Amazon. Yesterday I have paiche here in this restaurant, which is a fish from the Amazon River that exports are important for us. And someone that there was a fisherman there in the Amazon River that is working with us. While the global poverty rate has reached a historic low of 10%, the World Bank's goal to end extreme poverty by 2030 is at risk. In Peru, its poverty rate increased in 2017 to just over 20% leaving nearly 7 million Peruvians living in poverty. The World Bank decades ago said it was going to wipe out global poverty. Uh, we haven't seen that. You worked in development. Uh, it seems like they get a lot of criticism. Do they need to rethink things? Uh, what would your defense be of development agencies? Because I know you, they're near and dear to your heart, but they do get criticized quite a bit. Yeah, because we can have a, a, an, an objective, but sometimes you cannot see all the, all the, the, the results there because, as we mentioned before, this is a multifacetic problem and an evolutionary problem also because while you, we are moving ahead with some solutions, you will see that there is this new industrial revolution 4.0 with technology. Technology is very important for us, but technology can also wipe out some some employments that were tradition for us and you know medicine is changing because that that industrial revolution is coming you know the in, in artificial, artificial intelligence blockchain we can have that as a helping us as a solution but also it could be a new problem as we mentioned so how we can measure our job of changing things is Keep on track, moving ahead, be consistent, but at the same time, understanding that things are changing around us and we have to introduce those changes to reduce these problems. You, know? you, you bring up uh, a good point about the uh, industrial revolution that we're living through. Uh, you were on a panel with Jack Ma and Davos, and he said uh, the money should be spent on, on broadband infrastructure and not infrastructure bridges and roads. Now, I'm sure you would contend you got to spend it on both, but but you do have like these forward thinkers who think that the answer is uh, this revolution online. Do you have to balance it? We have to work with both, as I mentioned. And recently, I was talking with uh, broadband is one of the solutions, but sometimes we have to bring other so other uh, solutions that are more simple, less expensive, like broadband. We have broadband in Peru, 
but we have to go the extra mile. How you do the extra mile? Probably cellular phones, everybody has these intelligent telephones, can help. Uh, but also people in our local areas need the internet every, there, you know. So the combination is important, and we have to have the roads because, of course, Ma, Jack Ma is talking about only the, the 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 movement of services, but also we have to have produces, and I don't know if these people are bringing their materials over there, in the Amazon, for example. Uh, we have to make sure that the property rights of the people that know that those little plants are having the medicine for the people are recognized for these people, these property rights, because they are their knowledge, not the knowledge of a pharmaceutical outside. So we have to recognize this traditional knowledge and genetic knowledge that are there in those areas in the Amazon, for example. Since the late 1970s, more than 700 million Chinese have worked their way out of poverty. China's achievement is unprecedented in human history. It transitioned from a primarily agrarian society to an industrial powerhouse. Today, its economy is one of the largest in the world. To China, uh, China, of course, pulled so many, 700 million people out of poverty in, in a 40-year period. Are there lessons there for Peru? Well, China is such a different country of, as Peru, but I think we're learning a lot all together, you know. And the cooperation between China and Peru is quite big. Uh, we have a strategic alliance, that's how we call our, our relation. So the cooperation is there. I think China has moved through the industrialization, but also is learning a lot about how to protect the environment now. Before, the environment wasn't a, a topic for them, and I think this is good for us that we see China thinking about that climate change is real and they are working in the right direction to re reduce uh, uh, see the, uh, the emissions of, of, of contaminating gases and for us it's another uh, an important program to, to work together because we really believe we have to control climate change because we are affected by, uh, of, of the climate change that recent floods we have are a signal of that and so, yeah, there's a lot of possibilities of cooperation and learning all together. And how much concern do you have about climate change? Uh, because this is a problem that seems to be getting worse. That's why we have to work with programs to avoid the damage of climate change. For example, reforestation is very important in the highlands. Uh, if we, have for, uh, we work with the local people with forestry in the high, high areas. And what we call the harvesting of water. So we can work with them uh, with forestation, recollection of the water, and better way to use the water. Canalization, but also the new ways of having, uh, in simple ways, uh, better use of water. We can bring them and make sure that they don't lose that money when they have droughts or when they have, and we can avoid the is the flooding, you know, when you have a good uh, uh, amount of forest in the highlands, you can avoid the drought down, down, down the law. So that's, it's a simple program, not a lot of money, and you can have people protected and them responsible of their own lives. You can lift people out of poverty, which is a good thing, but then suddenly they have disposable income, then they can go and buy cars. Then you have more cars on the road, you have more pollution, you have the coal plants are burning. So even when you're successful at one thing, you create additional problems. Do you have to think about that as, as someone who's in politics and policy? Yeah, that's the unexpected effects. When we start bringing a lot of people out of poverty, in only one year, I remember one company started having to have 80% increase in the in the car selling 80 percent is how you do that you know it's true we have to start thinking about what we, we can do with the old cars to avoid it's good to have better better cars new cars which they have less contamination but you have to think about what we do with all these old cars that are in in the traffic and are contaminating and how we can bring better buses, as I mentioned, that are less contaminated to our cities and working with that. We have a problem called chatarreo. That means 
taking away all these old cars from the city and old buses and allowing the owners to have a better transportation, you know. So the issues of bikes and other transportation form, forms is important. This last year, I remember just talked with uh, people that are bringing scooters uh, into the, to Lima. These are electric scooters, and they have a problem. There is no legislation about scooters, <laughs> and we have to start thinking about legislation and regulation that bring them with more facility because these are less contaminated and they could probably bring less traffic. But also we have to be careful that they don't have problems with accidents in, in the city. You know? Global gender inequality can be found at every level of society, in education systems, political systems, companies, businesses to domestic and home lives. But educating young people could be the key to creating change. While more women are enrolled at colleges and universities, it does not translate into equal status between men and women. In 1969, Georgetown University, a private research university in Washington, D.C., began to admit female students. But nearly 50 years later, the school is predominantly led by men. As a public service leader in Latin America, the vice president is speaking to young people here about those challenges. So you're on your way to talk to college students today. And I know growing up, you never thought you'd be doing what you're doing today. Is one of the goals to try and inspire them? Are they the answer to helping us with poverty? I, I think that's for sure. I have a long experience as a professor, so I know when you can influence two young people and they can do something else and move, move their hearts, you can really do changes. So I think Having the opportunity here in Georgetown to talk with these students is fantastic for me. Do you get nervous about it at all? Of or? course. Yeah. Every time I talk <laughs> <laughs> in my life, every time before my class I got nervous. <laughs> but then you get in touch with them, they inspire you, they ask you questions, uh, they make you think about what you're saying, if you really believe or not. And then this interaction brings you the better of myself, I think. <laughs> As many are discovering, gender inequality can be easy to miss and even invisible to people. But as digital technology brings about massive global change, governments will need to prepare societies for change to a more equal society. Where girls have access to an education and women have equal pay for equal work for generations to come. I uh, once spoke to somebody here in the Washington, D.C. area who's very involved in, in poverty, uh, and she said what, what's sad about poverty, and I want to get your thoughts on this as we close, is that you could be on the metro sitting next to somebody and not have a clue of what they're going through. That they're, in, in many respects, poverty is invisible to, to people. They don't see it unless it's something up close. Is that one of the problems in addressing poverty, uh, that it's just this invisible group out there struggling to get by, and many of us are going about our daily lives. We've got our devices. We're kind of in our own little world. We don't realize how serious a problem it is. Oh, yeah, sometimes we don't realize how serious it is. So that's why we have to work with the people. We, we have to travel. In our case, our president is traveling all the time to, to the countryside, and he's talking with people. And I think that's important because you can connect and see what are the real problems over there. And of course, the people that are working in the ministries have to, to go and see what are the problems to connect with the real life. And of course, we have our own theory, we have our own knowledge, but at the same time, connect that with our, the, the reality, brings out the possibility to do something different and really help people bring them out of poverty. Madam Vice President, thanks so Thank much. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure.